see a mystery without wanting to do something about it. I got ahead of that from the youngest age. At the age of eight, I decided to be a scientist. All truth is forever. Some people think, oh, it was true 20 years ago, but it's not true now. Truth never changes. It's important for our people to know their history. If you, if you don't know your culture and you don't know your past, uh, what have you got? Tom's quests for truth, history and culture have taken him around the globe. Here on Rarotonga, the island that's had a love-hate relationship with this man, people still stop him on the street. And recognition not of his international glory, but of Papa Tom, the man who's been their local doctor, prime minister and vaka sailing hero. This 89-year-old's journeys have broken global frontiers in navigating space, sea, and the world of science, things that have earned him the titles Sir, Captain and Prime Minister. Thomas Robert Alexander Harris Davis, the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. Recently, he added another doctor to the list, as his lifelong history of groundbreaking achievements saw him honoured with a doctoral degree from Otago University in Dunedin, the city which was once the catalyst for some of his early ideas. Otago was where things I planned for my life started. I worked, of course, all the, all the time because I didn't have any other funds. I worked as a taxi driver, as a wool presser, and, as, and one time I went up to Otago, uh, uh, central Otago, and I had a team of horses up there to big horses to do ploughing and everything all over the summer holidays. Any native of Edinburgh could feel at home in Dunedin, particularly in winter. It was the shock of these Kiwi winters that first prompted his study on heat and cold adaptation. A self-proclaimed island boy, the freezing southland conditions made him determined to find out why some students were fine in the cold while he wasn't. He conducted his research in typically unconventional fashion, convincing fellow students to let him measure their changing temperature while surfing, using the most accurate, if not uncomfortable, method. I got my friends who, who surf in the winter, so I said, well, uh, my wife and I, Lydia, we'll, we'll give you cups of tea and everything else. You can use our house and everything, but <laughs> I want you to use them rectal thermometers. <laughs> Occasionally, not, we couldn't do it every time. His early research work in Dunedin changed the face of reigning scientific theory and was to have a resounding impact later in his life. In 1945, qualifying as the first Cook Islands medical doctor, however, wasn't enough for him to be accepted for the advertised position of medical officer to Rarotonga. Previously only held by Papa doctors, Papa Tom was rejected for the position three times, even though it remained unfilled. I was written a note that I was not suitable. So I applied again. Third time, and the fourth time, I applied again. I became interested to see what would happen, and I accepted them. I don't think I could find anybody else. <laughs> I was the last straw, if you like. With this service covering islands scattered over 850,000 square miles of the Pacific, there is need for more and more trained staff. Papa Tom worked to transform an antiquated and inadequate health system in Rarotonga. In this early footage of him, he started a nursing school and promoted public health measures to help alleviate problems such as high infant mortality. He also made his mark as one of the only medical staff willing to brave the seas and hurricane conditions to reach outer islands in emergencies. So there they kept sending messages uh, with a da 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 
Morse code that uh, the kids were dying and would they send a doctor and could a doctor get there. So finally I got a few of my friends together and, and we, I, was, we had, I was a member of the sailing club and we took the sails and took one of the launches that handled the cargo lighters and we put sails on it and we were just sitting in this. And of course the wind was from the northeast directly off Archie. So we had to sail like this. It took us about two, two and a half to three days to get there. Rough weather, nowhere to sleep, just sitting. We finally got there. They had a bonfire lit when we got there so we could see the island. And we got there. And I diagnosed it as an infection. And, and I, at that time, I, uh, I, I suspected provisionally diagnosed it as meningitis, but how could it get there? These things happen. That was quite a trip. The kids were all saved. There were no more deaths. After seven years of saving lives in the Cook Islands, Dr. Davis was offered the unique opportunity for postgraduate education at Harvard University, again the first Pacific person to do so. So he left his post as doctor to the islands for Boston, where he completed a Master's of Public Health. I was invited there from here. And that didn't sit very well with New Zealand because I didn't choose to go to England instead. And uh, But I chose Harvard of, of all the offers and I never regretted it. And there they gave me carte blanche, do any research you want. I said, this is my chance. That chance meant continuing his early research from Dunedin into the body's adaptation to cold and hostile environments which was put to practice in the US Armed Forces, and then, in that ultimate of frontiers, outer space. And here, in fine layers, uh, like uh, powdered charcoal. Papa Tom's many medical research and rescue missions have seen him work with indigenous communities around the globe, in remote regions of Alaska and the Himalayas, as well as the Pacific. But one of the most noted periods of his life was working beyond the globe, in outer space. His research work saw him being instrumental on biological aspects of the Apollo space program, the world-famous launch to put the first men on the moon. I was giving a, a scientific paper in Atlantic City and three people came up while I was giving the paper and came up on, two came up on the stage and said, you've got to go to Washington. I said, but I can't have to finish my paper. And they said, no, you need it in Washington. So they marched me off, off there and put me in a plane. And I said, what about my, my uh, stuff in the hotel? It's all packed. It's on, it's on the plane. But my, my family, they've been told that you won't, they won't be seeing you for a while, but you're perfectly safe. They flew me in a special plane to Washington, amongst 19 others that have been chosen also to plan the Apollo program for putting a man on the moon. On this July 20th, 1969. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Temperature became important because once you go up there, uh, as you go higher, it gets very cold, and up, up there it's, it's uh, absolute zero, minus 273 degrees uh, centigrade. And uh, so all these things I had to work out for the Apollo program, and later for the Mercury project, of which I was a member of the team for that too, sending the seven astronauts one after the other into space for that was called the Mercury project. I was involved in that fully. In preparing for the first human launch to the moon, again like the unconventional and often fearless endeavours that have characterised his work, one of his notorious incidents was jumping in to give a monkey mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. First time animals like that have gone up of, of the monkey type, I'd sent up uh, mice before that. We never saw the monkey after that, and it had uh, the, the electrodes still left in, in for the heart rate and the respiration rate and, and, and all that. And they took it straight from there and took it on a tour, six days. And I get back, I said, if you leave those in there, they'll get infected. And it was infected. 
They came back to me and the monkey was in bad shape. And to give it the anesthetist insisted on anesthetizing, I said, I'll just get in there and play, get it out. And, uh, and the anesthetist, and it died an anesthetist death. Well, I did, uh, I did uh, all the mouth to mouth and the, and the uh, chest uh, beating and everything else, but, but it was, that's what well, happened to that one. But all the others went well. After his work with the Apollo and Mercury space programs and what was to become NASA, in the 1970s, the call from Papa Tom's home country was becoming more insistent. The newly independent Cook Islands had economic and political problems and relatives and friends were imploring him to return home. Papa Tom decided to try yet another career as a politician. He returned to Rarotonga and was a founder of the Democratic Party in 1971. The biggest problem in Rarotonga with free visa access to New Zealand was with the local population leaving in droves for the promise of better work overseas. This had depleted the local labour force with little incentive for them to stay on the small island nation. Dr Tom Davis, Cook Islander by birth, is a graduate of the universities of Otago, Sydney and Harvard and a former member of the American Space Research Program. Now leader of the opposition in the Cook Islands Legislative Assembly, a practicing physician and an amateur sociologist, he feels that there are several factors involved. Paradise is just not enough. They need more than that. And the situation has been, especially recently, where the people are not getting the satisfactions that they need and then they are moving out. And we have over 4,000 people leave these shores for New Zealand, mostly. And perhaps if things improved back here, they would turn around and come back. In creating a draw card for Cook Islanders to develop their own country, Papa Tom encouraged free enterprise and a market economy as one of his main initiatives when he became Prime Minister in 1978. When I was invited to Harvard and went to America, I said, I've got to learn about, about uh, economics. I read every book I could and I came up with a system. It's not new. Singapore does it. All island states should do it. And so I applied it to here when I came back. My first speech on the 4th of August in 1978 was to tell our people, go plant, go do what you can to give yourself a, a better living. I will do as Prime Minister what I can. But do anything you like, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, doesn't hurt the environment, and does, it is not criminal. Go do it. I thought, after I sat down, I said, well, that was wasted on a desert air. Boy, in three months they had caught on, they had grass. That's how, how motivating this thing is. Everybody wants to be better than they are. They want to be better for their children. They want to be better for their friends. It's, it's a motivation there. You don't have to go to school to learn it. It's there. I want to be better than I am. I want to be better than my parents. And with that motivation, they caught on and off they went. Economically, I had to destroy the marketing board. And of course, everybody said, what do we do now? I said, you do it yourself and I'll help you. Within two years, the export was up to 12 million from 500,000. The clothing industry of two factories went way up and then three more developed. And they were employing a thousand people. And then people were dreaming of all sorts of things. The banana industry, the best people in it were five women. They said, oh, we can do this. And we and they ship every three weeks from New Zealand to go there to pick up the, the bananas from Rajataki and to ship them to New Zealand. Our popo industry went up. We, uh, I managed to get the 767s here, not because of the passengers, because our tourism wasn't, wasn't because of, the, of our produce, mainly pawpaws. And we were supplying New Zealand with everything. I got hold of the markets and said, send an agent here, 
so that you work with the farmers to grow what you want to grow and to pick them at the right time and do exactly, and you pay them. So instead of marketing, well, they never paid our people very well all the time. Uh, suddenly our people were rich and working directly with the markets. Nothing to do with government. And that's the way business should be. As Prime Minister, in the midst of a global economic downturn, he lifted the per capita income of Cook Islanders more than 10% per annum. He was knighted by the Queen for his services in 1980. That was a world record all the way. Give the people the freedom to do what they choose to do themselves and give them the opportunity to do it without interference. That's the all, oh, that's the policy. Papa Tom was soon to move on to more worlds of exploration, ancient Pacific navigation. Under Papa Tom's leadership, the Cook Islands economy was thriving. But the glory days turned sour when after seven years in Cabinet, his own party conspired to see his dismissal. The achievements that had put him on the global map as a scientist and scholar were not so recognised in his tiny island homeland, where at local level there were murmurings of arrogance and conceit. You've got the problem here of the tall poppy. They chop you down, and uh, especially in Parliament. And so I didn't argue with them, I didn't explain myself, I didn't want to. In, in Parliament they made jokes about it, about it as a, the monkey man, because I put some monkeys in space. And uh, uh, that was about it. Sir Thomas was not in Parliament today when the motion of no confidence was proposed in himself and his cabinet. They'd been wrangling behind the scenes over his budget since last week. It was used as the excuse to oust him. In the finish, unfortunately, some of his own team turned on him. Uh, not, I would say, people of integrity, uh, people whom the Cook Islands, I think it's fair to say, have suffered from since. We still have to drive our own economy, and um, that's where Papa Tom comes in, because he's the one who actually um, started the, uh, the policy of encouraging the private sector to drive the economy. Papa Tom turned from politics to his lifelong love, the ocean opening up another chapter in his remarkable list of feats. He used his scientific and engineering expertise, coupled with his knowledge of age-old sailing techniques, to build the first replicas of the original Polynesian voyaging canoes. He then recreated the navigational path of ancient Pacific migration and sailed around Polynesia using the stars on a night run, rather than the European method of using the sun. Befitting of many of his life's ventures, he was again the first person to do so. When we had the 92 uh, Festival of Arts, and the theme was voyaging canoes. So I thought, ah, here's my chance. So I managed to raise the money and built it up in my home and my veranda, uh, 60 feet long, the main hull, and uh, then the outrigger hull, she was an outrigger hulled canoe, then was carried by about three or four hundred people uh, from my home, which is still about two kilometers away, with fanfare, drums, and dancing girls, and everything. It was a great, great day. So if you follow the ancestors properly, you get a very good canoe. Papa Tom's navigational feats again put conventional theory to the test. The idea that Pacific migration was accidental and the lack of recognition of Polynesian navigational ability led him to recreate and follow the age-old oceanic path of our Pacific forebearers. Uh, a people without their culture is just, just a people. And our people had been misled that we sailed open canoes and drifted from here to there and didn't sail purposely anywhere, which made me mad all my life, angry at them. Uh, all the misinformation, uh, Sharp and his, uh, his thing was that these canoes just drifted everywhere. And of course, that wasn't the case. And when you're brought up in the culture as a, as a, as a kid, especially in my home, 
which is steeped with, uh, with the, the culture. And, so, and for me, of course, the, the, the Voyager canoes was, was the, the one that attracted me most. And uh, uh, to hear all this discrediting by anthropologists uh, just made me mad. And I said, one day I will, I will show them that we had bigger canoes and we could sail anywhere we want to do in the world. And that's, that's the satisfaction to me personally. But for the Polynesian people, it's, it's a great satisfaction too. Papa Tom's recreation of the ancient Waka voyages proved once and for all the sophisticated maritime skill of Pacific navigators and negotiating travel across the biggest ocean on the planet. For many thousands of years, the Polynesians sailed from island to island across the Western Pacific. They built great voyaging canoes using stone tools held together with ropes of twisted coconut fiber and powered with sails of woven pandanus leaf, covering hundreds of miles each day, bringing their families, root crops, stone tools, chickens and dogs. They could sail a thousand miles or more in two or three weeks. These Vaka journeys also opened up new navigating ventures for many other people, learning to sail like the Pacific ancestors. The second boat, Te Awatonga, came briefly to Auckland in 1996 on its way back to Rarotonga from Samoa. It's been one of the best lakes so far, uh, despite my great fear that it was uh, going to be one of the hardest, it ended up to be one of the, uh, the safest. We've got a lot of uh, nature display with the dolphins. Three days out of here there was a lot of dolphins around and there was like whole pods and they come around the canoe and uh, we saw a lot of whales and of course the birds diving for their meals, that was great, yeah. All the things that, you, uh, that our ancestors talked about, the dolphins got to appear and, and appeared to tell the people the canoe was coming. It all happened in Tahiti. The dolphins came and told the people. The people said, because I hadn't told them I was on my way there. And, and they said, but that's a sign there's a canoe coming. But there are no canoes these days. So they, but after got there, they said, ah, there it was. And they appeared in, in Moria, Peter Huahine. And in, in Bora Bora, they actually, they had planned to anchor me somewhere. They thought, again, I was a little paddling canoe. <laughs> so, and they wanted me to anchor in two feet or in, in, in 18 inches of water. And the dolphins had come in the day before, come right in to where they happened to be the mayor's place. And there's nice deep water there and, and, a, and, a, and a jetty. And they'd come in there and told them, this is where the canoe's got to be. You know, I've always heard the story about our ancestors sailing in seafarers and, you know, they uh, conquered the ocean. So I was out there to say, oh, this is really how my ancestors sailed. And for Papa Tom to do that, you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing for us. And the memory of it is still as strong. Uh, his passion, I have grabbed it too. Um, and uh, our captain, we uh, had Paio there. Paio, we have two pitmen, and then we have junior Mawati. I've always encouraged them to work with him because if he passes on, they have, you know, uh, learned from him and carry that that um, mana for sailing, voyaging. I don't think we 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 can actually say the word that truly d describes what pride our people have, have got now with what Papa Tom's given our people, it's indescribable. From the medical point of view, from the political point of view, from the cultural point of view, Papa Tom has touched the hearts of many people. I think it's important that um, children become aware of, of people like Papa Tom who've um, done a lot, achieved a lot. Um, he's one of our better educated citizens. Um, he's multi-talented, you know, a, a truly universal man. Universal man, renaissance man, father of Pacific navigation. 
However he's been described, there's no denying that Papa Tom lives life to the fullest. He wrote the Cook Islands national anthem in his spare time and was a master sportsman, champion boxer, racing car driver. These days he settles for quieter moments, having only recently given up riding his Harley Davidson. He's just finished a stint as the Cook Islands High Commissioner in New Zealand, possibly making him the oldest serving diplomat in the world. He returned home recently to the Cook Islands and the house he grew up in, where despite the many titles he's had in life, he still prefers the name Island Boy. It's a grand old place, that's always fair to see. You're telling me I'm just a little Hawaiian, a homesick home. I'm about to go to my fish and story. This program was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.